We serve a wonderful God who's interested in us, cares about us, and shows up every time we're at church. We serve a good, good God. The title of my message this evening is a simple word, peace. And I want to look, we'll begin in Isaiah chapter 53, and we'll um, explore peace a little bit tonight. Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah is the first of the major prophets, major because he wrote a lot, um, talked a lot about, had a lot of prophecies about Jesus, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, if you're wondering where it is, Isaiah chapter 53, and we'll start at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When we quote this scripture, we use it when we're talking about Jesus, his death on the cross. We use it to explain why we're healed. We use it to explain why our sins are taken away, why it was necessary for Jesus to die. We use this scripture. It's a very common scripture to hear preached and spoken about. But I want to look at the middle part of verse 5. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And the word peace here in the Hebrew comes from the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom is more than just the absence of conflict. So peace, when the Bible is talking about peace here, it's not just not fighting. It's soundness, completeness, a total well-being. Peace is more than just coffee and I not fighting. Peace is working together in harmony. Peace is being together in unity. And peace is not necessarily a place of silence. Because peace allows laughter, joy. Peace allows people to relax and spend time with one another. So peace does not necessarily mean silence, but can include laughter and friendship. And peace is beneficial to people and to societies. So Jesus came, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Chastisement, the word does not appear very often in the Bible. But when it does, it literally means punishment. So Jesus was punished for our peace. Philippians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. If you get to Hebrews, you've gone too far. Philippians chapter 4. This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And I want to start reading at verse 2. Now, if I say these names different to how you say them, I'm right because I've got the microphone. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. I beseech Euodius and beseech Sintish that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with many, with other my fellow labourers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, 
and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul is asking two sisters in the church, Euodius and Sintish, to settle their differences. He goes on to ask the church to help them make peace. Not just to tolerate each other, or one shows up early to church so one shows up late, and then the first one quickly leaves so she doesn't have to hang around after service to bump into Sintish, because she's awful, that Sintish. He's asking the church to help bring peace. Now, I'm not a woman, so I asked Lolly, what do women fight about? Because she'd know she's a woman. And she said, and I thought, it's men. That was not the answer. The answer was misunderstandings. And Lolly gave me an example of a problem in the church. In a church that she'd been a part of, not this one. And the problem was in the music department. And one dear sister in the church was the worship leader sometimes. And so she'd lead the praise and worship. And the pianist and the head of the music team was also a woman. And sometimes this dear lady would lead the praise and worship. And if you've ever stood behind this pulpit trying to lead praise and worship, there are times when things don't go quite as you expect. Tonight I signalled bridge and sang chorus. And then went, oops, that wasn't right, and moved into the bridge like everybody else was doing. But the rest of you didn't know that you were worshipping, but I knew I got it wrong. And Hammy is nodding his head going, yep, you got it wrong. And what would happen was this sister who was worship leading would look at the pianist and glare. And that made the pianist very uncomfortable. Now you have to understand, when you're in church, you're all trying to love Jesus. And when you're worship leading, you're trying to do the best job you can that Jesus can come in and the church can rejoice and love God and the presence of God and we can feel it. You're trying really hard to do all those things, but you're also a bit nervous because you're looking at a bunch of people's faces. And we live, we're, we're in a church where people worship. It's not that bad. But sometimes you go to church and what you see when you're worship leading is people going, not in this church, in this church we're fine, but you do see it. And you're like, what do I have to do? And so this, this woman and this woman, not in this church, be aware, not in this church, that caused some problems. And so in churches, while we all love Jesus, we're all trying really, really hard to be good Christians, these two sisters, I'll get their names right, Euodius and Sintish had a problem. But Paul is asking them to make peace with one another and asking the church to help them to make peace. Now in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and verse 7, I'm going to read it in the New King James. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So Paul is talking about peace, trying to bring peace to a church. And one of the issues that happens is Euodius and Sintish, Euodius has her friends in the church, and maybe her husband, and maybe his friends. And Sintish has her friends, and suddenly what you've got is two women that are arguing, but it gets bigger than them. Because, let's pick this church, alright, let's pick this church. Because Joy, Joy's lovely, we love Joy, she does a great job in the Sunday school, I'm pretending Joy. Joy suddenly has a problem with Sister Pauline. Right? Sister Pauline is lovely, lovely. And Sister Joy is lovely, but they've got a problem. So Brother Otto can't talk to Brother Hammy because Joy and Sister Pauline aren't talking, Right? And then, let's face it, the assistant pastor probably can't talk to Sister Pauline and Brother Otto because his mum and dad are having problems, right? Well, that causes a bit of an issue because the pastor has to talk to both, 
but his daughter is married to Daniel, who's there's a problem. And so Sister Pauline says, "Well, you know what? I'd, I'll just go. I'll show up late." Which means because she's shown up late, she hasn't got to chat to Sister Louisa and Sister Everett before church. And suddenly Sister Louisa and Sister Everett are upset because Sister Pauline didn't say hello to them this morning. So what was a quibble because Sister Hoff forgot Joy's birthday becomes this big deal that is causing huge problems in the church. We don't have those problems in this church. In this church, we really, really, really don't have these problems and I'm sure Sister Pauline and Sister Joy love each other and it's fine. But this church in Philippi had problems. And Paul is trying to say to them, this is how you get peace. And he says, be anxious for nothing. The King James says, be careful for nothing. But with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the God of peace uh, and... And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So if we have a problem in the church, out of the church, but in our family, wherever it is, if we have a problem, we go to God with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. We make our request known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your heart will keep your mind through Christ Jesus. So the way we deal with conflict, the way we find peace is to give it to God. Peace will come if they will focus on the things that are true, the things that are honest, the things that are just, the things that are pure, the things that are lovely, the things that are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise. And so to bring it to this church, Sister Joy says, well, you know what? Sister Hoff did marry a lovely man who's very good at gardening. That might be the only virtue she can find in Sister Pauline. But you focus on the virtue. You focus on if there's any reason for praise at all think on these things because what we're called to do as christians and what the tongue and interpretation was tonight is we need to see ourselves as god sees us we need to see each other as god sees us and so we look at one another and if we begin to say clyde always has his hair like that and i don't like it and have you noticed his ties and that shirt Why is he wearing a white shirt? It's just, it doesn't go with those pants. If we focus and make everything negative, suddenly there's problems. But if we go, I really love how Clyde worships. I really appreciate that he's willing to give his all to God. I enjoy that he's faithful to the house of the Lord, that he's willing to give himself to God, that he's willing to do all those things. Suddenly what his hair looks like is less of a problem. I like your hair, Clyde, it's fine. But we, we can get so caught up in negative things that we don't focus on what is just, what is honest. We lose sight of what is actually true. And instead, we focus on the negative. So Paul, has, Paul says to them, I tried to demonstrate these things when I was with you. You saw me do these things. And Paul reminds the entire church at Philippi and you tonight that the God of peace will be with them if they would get back to the basic truths that he taught them. How could Paul be confident that the God of peace would be with them? Paul knew Isaiah. When the New Testament church was happening when the church in philippi when they said please open your bibles they didn't have the book of philippians their bible stopped at malachi but paul wrote them a letter and he knew isaiah paul understood isaiah and paul understood that jesus had come to pay the price 
for our sins, for our transgressions against one another, for healing, and for peace. Jesus paid the price for those things. And as Christians, it seems we're very comfortable saying, Jesus died for my sins. Jesus can take away my sins. Sometimes we get all excited about how big my sin is, and Jesus could never forgive my sin, but when we find that place of repentance, we understand Jesus' blood covers all sin. And we, we're willing to accept that. We're willing to accept that Jesus paid the price for the things I did to hurt my mum. Jesus paid those, that price as well. The transgressions that I committed against others, Jesus paid the price for those too. We're willing, and we did it before church tonight, we're willing to lay hands on the sick and expect them to recover because we understand that it's by his stripes we're healed. We, we understand that and we accept that. But what we, as a, what we sometimes as Christians, I think, fail to understand is that we can have peace as well because Jesus paid the price for peace. And more than peace as an absence of conflict, but peace as a total well-being, as uh, soundness, as a place of joy and love and laughter. He paid the price for that peace. We live in a world... You kids don't understand this. You're all too young. When we were kids, when I was a child, when I was a child, we didn't have screens. Screens didn't exist. The nearest we got to a screen was something that was this fat, sat on a box this big. You put in a disc that was this large and you had to use something called a keyboard. Mice hadn't been invented yet. I don't believe we had mice when we first started. And you, uh, you did stuff on this which made stuff happen on there. It's called a computer. So that was what we had. We didn't have screens. And mum would say, go outside and play. What do you do outside? There's grass. Well, that's itchy. There's sand and that's gross. There's trees, but you fall out. It's like, what are you doing outside? Go outside and play. It was a much less busy time. Today, we're busy all the time. We have so many... Now, we had a washing machine as a child. My mother never beat dresses against rocks at the river. That never happened. But I understand 100, 100 years ago, no washing machines. So washing was you did your washing one day a week because it was a lot of work. These days, we have all these time-saving devices and we're busier than ever. And our busyness sometimes means we don't have any peace. We're so busy rushing from here, rushing to there, rushing around doing. Got to check Facebook because if I don't like the latest post, they're going to be upset with me. It works both ways. It's a hassle. I'm not on Facebook. Please, if you hit me, send me a friend request. I'll accept it. Two months after you've sent it. It's not because I don't love you. It's just because I never check. The... But we're so busy with our lives that we get frantic and have no peace. But Jesus came to give us peace. We don't think, and advertising and society and consumer attitudes, we don't think we can have peace in our lives unless we get the next best thing. Unless we get the latest pair of shoes, unless we get the latest iPhone, unless we have the newest whatever, we think our life won't be complete. We think we won't be whole. We think we need those things. But what Jesus did, he came and died to give us peace. And that peace isn't found in buying something new. That peace isn't found in getting something pretty. That peace isn't found in... Um, finding your significant life partner. That peace isn't found in those things. Peace is only found in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus purchased our peace. And as true as Calvary is, as true as our sins are taken away, as true as healing is available, peace is also available. Acts chapter 10 and verse 36. I love Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 is what opens the door for you to be in church tonight. Who's Jewish? Anybody Jewish? Put your hand up if you're Jewish. Not Jewish. Okay. Acts chapter 10 is why you're able to be at church tonight. Because until Acts chapter 10, you had to be Jewish to be saved. Well, that's what the disciples and the apostles thought at first. But Acts chapter 10... There's this Roman, this Italian guy, and he's a centurion, so he's a soldier. And uh, he's a good, good guy. He prays every day. He gives money to the poor. He's a good guy. He's a Roman. He's a man of war. He's invaded Israel, but he's a good guy, and he's trying hard to be a good guy. And while he's in prayer, an angel shows up. Now, that's never happened to me. I'm looking forward to the day that I see my first angel. But Cornelius, not even a Christian, mind you, an angel shows up and says, send off to Joppa, find um, Simon Peter, who's staying with Simon the Tanner, and uh, get him to come to your house and he'll tell you what you need to do. So Cornelius, the Roman guy, does that. And Peter's had a vision himself. And uh, he decides that he'll go to this non-Jews, non-Jewish person's house. He'll go to this Gentile's house. And he takes a bunch of friends because he needs witnesses. Because the Jews and the non-Jews, the Jews didn't hang out with non-Jewish people. And so the, Peter goes and he brings some friends. And he gets to this man's house. And what does he start his sermon with? Acts chapter 10, verse 36, this is after Peter arrives and does his introduction, this is where he starts his message. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Peter's first, Peter's topic to this man of war, this Roman soldier, this invader of Peter's homeland, is peace. And he says, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And so if we want peace in our lives, Jesus Christ has to be Lord of all. And so Peter goes on preaching from this idea that Jesus is Lord of all. He is the God of peace. He talks about how wonderful God is and how God has demonstrated um, his goodness to his people and has done all these things. And then in verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And so then the Gentiles get the Holy Ghost. And Peter looks to his Jewish friends and says, they're talking in tongues. Now what? Now they're, they're talking in tongues. Well, uh, that was for Jews only, but now they're talking in tongues. And so Peter says, I've been preaching about peace, And suddenly the Holy Spirit's been poured out. These people are talking in tongues. And Peter then says, you read verse 48, Peter commands them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they are. Because Peter understands the plan of salvation. This repentance, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry I made a mistake. I want to make you Lord of all in my life. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to give my life to you, repentance. And then they've skipped a step. They've received the Holy Spirit. They're talking in tongues. God's working. And Peter says, right, you've, you've received the Holy Ghost. Now you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And that if you hang around this church long enough and you get the Holy Ghost and you're not baptized, someone will say to you, uh, it's time for baptism. Because that's what Peter did. Now, we're not like Peter. We say, it might be nice perhaps if, because, you know, Jesus loves you and we'd really appreciate it. I think God would be, perhaps, maybe get baptised in Jesus' name. We're nice about it. Peter said, 
<coughs> you've talked in tongues, you've got the Holy Spirit. God is living inside of you. You're a dirty vessel. Get in the water. You'll get clean in Jesus' name right now. No questions. No, I hope I don't offend you. Peter just went, this is happening? Yeah, it's happening now. And because he understood the plan of salvation. He preached peace to a man of war and the Holy Spirit fell. Our God is a God of peace. And it comes when Jesus is Lord of all. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, again, if you get to Hebrews, you've gone too far, but it is after all the eons. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Peace is an absence of fear. If you're living in a peaceful environment, you don't have fear. We live in a country where we enjoy peace. We're not afraid to wander around the streets. We're not afraid to come out of our front door, walk up to the end of the street, bring our rubbish bins in. We're not afraid to head down to the shops. We're not afraid. We, we have peace in this country. And peace is an absence of fear. God came to take away fear. We don't have a spirit of fear when we have Jesus Christ, when he's Lord of all. We have peace. Peace allows love to flourish because you can take time to let love develop. Peace allows a sound mind. It gives clarity of mind. When we're fearful, when we're busy, when we're rushing and running, our minds get full. But when we stop and say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of all, we can receive a sound mind because that's what God gives to us. Jesus was chastised. He was punished for our peace. And I find in well, what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, so go after Hebrews, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. And he's talking about he, Jesus paid the price for our sins, for our transgressions, for our iniquities. By whose stripes ye were healed. So healing, our healing has happened. Peter says, by whose stripes ye were healed. Our healing has happened. We reach back to Calvary for our healing because our healing has happened. When we lay hands on you, when we anoint you with oil, when we pray for healing in your life, we're reaching back to Calvary where we say the stripes that were put on Jesus' back, the whipping that he experienced, that means I am healed. It's finished. It's back there. I'm going back to Calvary for my healing. By his stripes, you were healed. And our peace is the same. Our peace happened at Calvary. The busyness in our minds, the running to and fro that we do, the issues that Karthik and I have with each other, the problems that we face between ourselves, the conflicts that we have inside of ourselves, these things that take away peace are available in Jesus Christ because he died for us on Calvary. Because of Calvary, we reach back in time and say, I'm having my peace now. But to get to Calvary, we need to make Jesus Lord of all. To get that peace, we need to make Jesus Lord of all. Which was what Paul was saying to Euodius and to Sintish, the things that I taught you when I was there, Calvary that brought you salvation, go back to Calvary and get peace. Recognize what is true. Recognize what is lovely. Recognize that God is in that sister that you're fighting with. Recognize those things and let God's peace step into that situation. Jesus bore our sins in his body. Our search for peace is found in that same broken 
body. But Jesus didn't just die on the cross, Jesus rose again. Rose from the dead and we have that hope too. Because he rose again, we understand that we also will one day rise again. Jesus brought peace for you tonight. Jesus brought peace for you now. Sister Fiona, can I get you to come please? Are you struggling to know peace in your life? Have you allowed Jesus to give you salvation but still struggle for peace? Do you have a relationship with somebody that needs peace brought into that relationship? Do you need a quiet mind, a mind with peace? Peace is available tonight because of Jesus Christ. He purchased peace for you at Calvary. Let's all stand this evening.